Amen. Thank you, Brother Brady. Tremendous song, tremendous message of that song. Without the grace of God, we'd be beating the air uselessly, living life in emptiness. Because of the grace of God, our lives have meaning. I'm so thankful. Thanks for that message and that, and that message and song, Brother Dalton. Looking forward to when we get that uh, recording studio finished up here. Not too long now. Lord willing, get some music pumped out in First Baptist Church. We're blessed with some, some talented musicians here. And I'm glad, I'm glad to be uh, serving in just such a great church. And so we're looking forward to that. And hopefully it'll be a blessing to you as well. If you have not been upstairs yet in the balcony, you can take a tour up there sometime. It is safe. I mentioned Wednesday night in the process. I fell through the floor, but that should not happen now. And so I'm just fine. I caught myself, didn't spill my coffee or drop my phone. In fact, I finished the phone conversation, and I don't think they even knew that I had fallen um, up to my waist uh, up there. You say, well, what happened, Pastor? Well, there's a piece of wood that I thought was supported. It wasn't. And apparently it can't hold my weight. And uh, but that piece of wood is no longer there, but it, it, they're doing a great job up there. And looking forward to using the balcony uh, this year at First Baptist Church as well. If you have your Bibles open to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. This year our theme is only God. Began the year preaching some messages on the place that God ought to have in our life and used, have used this verse, John 17, verse 3. I want to back up a little bit in the passage today. We are not here on this earth just because. We are not here by accident. We are not here just for ourselves here on earth. We are here for a purpose. We are here for a reason. And yet so many have missed the purpose, the reason that God has placed them on this earth. There are Christians who have missed the purpose and the reason that God has placed them on this earth. There are so many things, we looked at that early in the year, there are so many things that pull at us. So many bright lights that catch our fancy, so many trinkets that sparkle in the sun And the trinkets of life and the bright lights, sometimes of money, sometimes of promotion and success, sometimes of family. All those things cause us, if we're not careful, to be distracted from why we're here. I've challenged us and challenging us, myself included, to this year in 2021, make our lives about only God. And everything else must be second, subservient to God himself. John chapter 17, we had a tremendous message from Dr. Flanders two weeks ago out of these chapters in John. I so appreciate his ministry here. You pray for him. He's here this morning. He was supposed to be preaching out and still is struggling with some health issues. You pray for him. The doctors may have a solution, but we want to see him back on the road preaching out as soon as we can. Though we love to have him here, I sure am thankful for his ministry out. John chapter 17 and verse 1, the Bible says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. I want to pause there very briefly. Jesus came down from the glory of heaven. For this particular moment in human history, very shortly after this, uh, this, this passage of Scripture, he will be betrayed. Shortly after that, taken to the cross, crucified, and then the plan of salvation will have been accomplished. Jesus is called the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, the foundation of the earth. This was put in motion eons before Jesus said now the hour has come he goes on in verse number two as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to many to as many as thou hast given him verse number three this morning and this is life eternal this is eternal life 
The Bible says, for the wages of sin in Romans chapter 6 is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. When our time here on earth is done, there will only be one of two places that we go. Either to a place of eternal life, that is life in heaven, with God through his son Jesus Christ. Or a place of eternal death and separation and suffering. The Bible calls that place hell. Jesus is the key to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. Jesus in John chapter 14, just a few chapters previously says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, and this is life eternal. You see, if I knew there was a way to have life eternal, I would want to find out what it is. If I knew there was a way to have some eternal happiness, glory, and joy, would you not want to know what it is? Would you not want to tell everyone else what it is? We, we uh, on, online review items. If you ever bought anything from Amazon.com, order something online, you can find their reviews. And if something is good, people will give it five stars. If it's terrible, they'll give it one star and say, I wish I could give it zero stars. Life is eternal is more than a five-star review. Why is it sometimes, Christians, that we are more consumed with telling people what we found on earth, what is good, than what is life eternal? And Jesus says, and this is life eternal, and here it is, that they might know thee, the only true God. This morning, if I can, and tonight... I'd like to turn our, turn our focus to those words that they might know thee, the only true God. Or if I can, do you know God today? Lord, I thank you for this time that we have. I'd ask that you would help me as I preach to speak those things that would be true and right. Lord, I need you this morning. Lord, I've tried to prepare a few things, but Lord, I ask that you would give me the power that I crave this morning. Speak through me. Lord, long after people may forget who spoke, may they remember your truth from your word. Lord, would you touch hearts today? Would you challenge Christians? And Lord, if there's someone here who has never trusted you as their Savior, would they respond and trust you today? Lord, use this time. Do a work that only you can do. May we respond to the way you, you'd have us to respond to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Jesus says that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. The only God. I have, fi I have found that people, many people, if not most people, are quite content with a small view of God, with a little bit of knowledge of God. And the Bible is, is going to teach us, I'm going to show us today, how the Bible challenges us, the Bible commands us, the Bible instructs us to know, K-N-O-W, to know God, the God of the universe. We have to know God, not as we wish he was, but as he actually is. You see, we sometimes have customized God to fit our particular ideas. In this current culture, we've customized God and tailored him to suit our own tastes, what we like about him. We want a God, if we're not careful, uh, who is soft on sin. There are countless churches where they preach a God that doesn't care what someone does as long as they are happy. As I read my Bible, I find the exact opposite. That God cares this past week in our family devotions, we've been reading through Leviticus. That's some heavy reading. The law, especially for my children, 12, 10, and 8. Some heavy reading. They've asked me, Dad, what does this word mean? You know that every once in a while in the Bible, you may come across a word you don't know what it means. 
we use the King James Version. I believe it's the preserved Word of God. You're going to find some words sometimes you don't know what it means. There are some churches that say, listen, we're going to change the Bible so, uh, so that you never have a question about a word. I find even in those other versions, there are still words that you don't know what they mean. There are going to be some times you don't know, you may have to look it up. I it was last night, my daughter asked me what a word meant, plastered, plastered. Not one we typically use nowadays. But these churches, they've, they've tried to make God to suit their tastes. And as I read the book in Leviticus, I'm reminded that God cared a lot about the little details. He cared about the little things. And he still cares about the little things. We have tailor-made a God to fit our needs who's soft on sin and who seems to always be on standby. We want a God who we can just dial help when we need it and hang up when we don't want to talk to him any longer. God, I want you to be available on my terms. And God says, you must seek to know me. A God who we have made more genie-like than the God of the universe. A God to maybe grant us our wishes. A God who we have, if we're not careful, we have tried to domesticate God to the point that he has no standards, no expectations, no agenda except our own happiness and contentment and comfort. And we have to know God not as we wish he was, but as he actually is. We are content to have a small knowledge of God. We think, well, that's great, Pastor. I came to church Sunday morning. Now I know God. And I hope you're here in church every single Sunday morning. Hope you come back Sunday night. And I hope you come on Wednesday nights. We here at First Baptist Church, we meet three times a week. We try to worship God through music, through his word. And we're content with a small knowledge of God. Well, I memorized a verse when I was young in Sunday school, and that's good enough. And my friends, I want to tell you this morning, that's not good enough. And this is life eternal, that they might know the, the only true God. We're content with a small knowledge of God. We are content with a jaded knowledge of God. As we perceive him, so is he. And for some, they have walked away from God because in their view, God wasn't good to them. God allowed something to take place that didn't, didn't fit their sense of justice, fairness, or goodness. God allowed a tragedy in their life, and my heart goes out for that. We have many needs here at First Baptist Church, and I challenged my class this morning, Sunday school class, but I hope that you pray for the other folks here at First Baptist Church. That is one thing that we can do, and the Bible says the fervent, the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That means it does a whole lot of things. I hope you're praying for each other and praying for the needs. But perhaps there's those who have been jaded by their knowledge of God because God allowed some particular hardship in their life that they didn't view to be fair. In my life, there's some things that I would say, if I get to choose, I'd choose something different. I have read the book of Job, as maybe you have. I look at Job, and in my sense of fairness, it's not fair to Job. He lost his children because he was so righteous. That's the premise of the beginning of the book. He is so righteous that God says, try him. He was so faithful. He lost all his riches. In my sense of fairness, I think that's not fair. But in my sense of faith, I know that God is always good. And if we're not careful, we'll be content with a jaded view, a jaded knowledge of God. We're content with a cursory knowledge of God. We're content to leave God on the shelf and take him off when it seems convenient. We're content to check the boxes and believe that that equals knowing God. We think if I come every service, then I know God, and that'll help you know God. But my friend, we cannot be content with a small God because we are called to know God. It's amazing that the, that the finite can know the infinite. We can comprehend the limitless being limited. 
And we can process the supernatural being natural. You see, we are to strive, we are to know intimately the God of the universe. His name is Yahweh or Jehovah, not just a God, but the God, not just a son of God, but the son of the God. We are to know God. This morning, I want to challenge us this evening to know God. I'm afraid there are Christians who have just been content to crack open their Bible, read a few verses, check off the box internally or externally, and walk away thinking, I know God now. And my friend, knowing God is not checking off the box. Today is Valentine's Day, is it not? Hopefully, you've done some things for that special someone. Bought cards, presents, extravagant gifts for this wonderful Hallmark holiday. Maybe you've chosen as a couple in a relationship to say, you know what, we will categorically as a couple reject Valentine's Day. And that's fine as well. My wife is shaking her head, no, I guess I'm not, I don't have that option in life. I remember the first time that I met my wife, we were set up on a blind date. I resisted meeting her, she resisted meeting me. Finally, through a variety of circumstances, a man had come up here to the church and he was in a ministry, he was, he was in our RU program, we sat down at lunch, he said, he said, J.D., I know the girl you're going to marry. He said, her name's Doreen and she goes to church in Flint. I actually was dating another girl at the time. And I said, well, I said, I'm dating this other girl. And he looks at me like I'm looking at you and he says, break up with her. <laughs> I thought that was pretty forward. I said, well, and Pastor Scott, he was there that day. He can verify this story. I said, well, I'm, I'm dating this girl. Kind of laughed it off like a, like a brain. And he said, he said, no, no, I'm serious. Break up with her. I said, okay, okay. No, no, I'm dating this girl. He said, no, break up with her. You're going to marry this girl. I looked at Pastor Scott that day and I said, Pastor Scott, you better tell him to stop talking or I'm going to punch him in the throat. <laughs> Pretty loyal guy I date a girl. You know. He goes back to church that Sunday, maybe three days later, and he sees Doreen at church, the church he was going at. He says, Doreen, I met the guy you're going to marry. He's the youth pastor up at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. She said, Mr. So-and-so, I'm dating this guy, this different guy. He looks at her like he looked at me and said, break up with him. <laughs> well, she did, and I did, and he bugged us. Eventually, we went on a blind date. I remember the first time that I met her. She was getting off her bus, her bus route there at that church, and I was sitting in the, in the Escalade there, the, the Cadillac Escalade, someone, uh, the, the man's Escalade. I saw her get out and had really no desire to meet her, but I figured if I didn't, he'd never leave me alone. She got out, and I thought, well, she's pretty cute. This could be worse. I'm honest. We had a tremendous time. She gets in the back of this escalator. We're sitting next to each other. And she said, I just want to tell you, I didn't want to meet you. And I'm moving back to New Jersey. And I said, that's all right. I didn't want to meet you either. <laughs> Foundation for a wonderful marriage. <laughs> if there's ever a fight now, we go back to, I didn't want to meet you anyway. <laughs> we went to a uh, to a place in Flint, they had a breakfast buffet. Went there after church, it was a, it was a brunch that day. And uh, you may not know my wife well, you may not know this about her, but my wife enjoys her food. She's a skinny little thing, but she can eat. I shouldn't tell you this, but I will. In college, there was some food eating contests, and she beat the college men there in how much she can eat. All right, she just has a metabolism, the, the speed of a jackrabbit, and mine is the speed of a turtle that's been run over. It always irritated me on dates when the girl wouldn't eat anything. All right, all nervous. We went that day and we shut that buffet down. <laughs> they said, you leave now. You leave now. <laughs> we don't have any food left. Well, from there, as they say, the rest is history. We spent some time on the phone and went out to see her when she went back to New Jersey and see her parents. And then she came back here and things progressed. And now, 16 years later, three children, we think we're going to stick it out. But thankfully, each morning when I get up, I say, okay, honey, how are you? Good. It is nice to see you. You look beautiful. 
Have a wonderful day. How long would that last? How long? Not long at all. But as I would finish my check boxes, would she then say, oh, honey, you just love me so much and you know me so well. Would she say that? I don't think so. No lady or man would. Wow, the, the, the care and concern. Uh, honey, I noticed that you like cream in your coffee. Oh, honey, you're so sweet. Well, that's not a relationship, is it? Not a bunch of, che- not a bunch of check boxes. And listen, my friend, if we're not careful, we will take our relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, and instead of knowing him, we will seek just to check off some boxes and say, aha, I know God because I was in church. I know God, I cracked open my Bible. And my friend, we must seek to know God. We must seek to know Jesus Christ. And we have the privilege to know him. Let me give you two statements this morning about knowing God and then some more tonight because we must know him for salvation. We must know him personally. And we can only, first of all, we can only know God because God has chosen to reveal himself to us. We can know God because he has made himself known to us. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. You see, God is revealed in his word and we spend time in his word not to check off a box, but we spend time in the word of God to know God. God himself. In his word, he reveals his names. You see, people did not know the name of Jehovah before he told them his name. The heavens declare the glory of God. They show a God. But God came down and he said, this is my name. And the names of God reveal his character. They reveal who he is, Jehovah, the self-existing one, El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty the Most High God, El Alam, the Everlasting God, Yahweh Yireh, the Lord will provide. Yahweh Nissi, the Lord is my banner. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. And the names of God reveal the character of God. How well do you know God? You see, those names of God reveal who he is. The self-existing one, I am that I am means that God is everything. Any need you have in your life, God is the answer. If you're short on hope and confidence today, God is full of hope and confidence. If you're short of of a mission and a vision, God is full of mission and a vision. If you're short of money, God is full of that. He's full of everything. God is all that we need. I'm not promising that everything in your life will be peachy and just amazing, that it will be peachy and there'll be no tragedy or there's no hardship. God never promises that the way is always easy, but he promises never to leave us nor to forsake us. Three times Paul asked God to remove a thorn in the flesh and he said, God, remove this thorn and Jesus answered answer not that he would remove it but he said my grace is sufficient for you Paul goes on to say most gladly therefore will I glory in my infirmities will I rest in my hardships will I rest in my tragedy that the power of Christ that the power of God may rest upon me you may be empty today and God the I am can fill the emptiness The names of God reveal who he is. He's revealed by his character. Ephesians tells us, but God who is rich in mercy. His character is full of mercy, full of compassion, full of grace, full of love, full of holiness. And there are different people who want to emphasize different particular characteristics of God. There are some who will overemphasize his grace. There are others who will overemphasize something else, but God is all of these things, perfectly balanced in perfect harmony and perfect unity. God is revealed by his names, he's revealed by his character, and he's revealed by his work. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. 
On the drive to church this morning, my kids commented on the beauty of the trees out there. The snow ice crystals made the outdoors, in our estimation, just light up. Isn't it amazing what God has done just in creation? Simple trees with no leaves, and they're gorgeous. God cares about the little things. God cares about the small things. Someone once said, man has poked out his own spiritual eyes. God has made himself clear and visible in the natural world. And if someone misses God, the fault is not God's, but man's. If we don't know God, it's not because God has not chosen to reveal himself, it's because we've chosen to ignore him. Because not only can we know God because God has chosen to reveal himself, we can know God because God has promised to be found. God has promised to be discovered. Right now, in Michigan, there is a treasure hunt going on. I caught some of your attention right now. It's for a million dollars. There's actually 10 of them going on throughout the U.S. It's the hunt for Blackbeard's treasure. This company buried in 10 states chests with a number to call. When you call, because you found the hidden treasure, they will give you $1 million, $10 million hidden throughout the U.S. You can download the map today for $50. <laughs> oh, oh, I get it. I get it. I had read about this a few months back. They launched it. They started talking about it, I believe, last July and June. And in December, these maps launched. I remember they had estimated how much they would make on the map download, and they will far exceed the $10 million if everyone finds it. That's just if they find it. And if you were to pay the $50, there is still no guarantee that you will find the million-dollar treasure. You have to follow the clues. I have not and I have no plans to pay $50 to download a treasure map that I probably cannot find anyway. They really don't want you to find it, right? If it were easy, they wouldn't make any money on this endeavor, but their point is to make some money on it. Do you know that it doesn't cost me any money to find out about God? Aren't you glad that I don't have to pay just to, to know about God? Oh, you can find out about God if you pay $25, $50. Come in the church. Oh, go to church here. Swipe your credit card. Now you know about God. God promises to be discovered, and he doesn't make it that difficult. He's not hiding all these clues, and if you happen to open the wrong door, you... No, no, no. God wants to be found the Bible says, Jesus says in John chapter 14, he that hath my commandments and keepeth me, is he it is that loveth me, and that he that loveth me shall be loved to my father, and I will love them and will manifest, reveal myself to him. Jeremiah, God says in 29 verse 13, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. We are commanded to search for God. This is a promise. There's a promise that if you seek, God promises to be found. It's a guarantee. You know, if that treasure was a guarantee, I'd pay the $50. If they said, well, you pay 50 bucks, you'll guarantee to find a million dollars, I'd pay it, and I guarantee that you would pay it if you believe that. I, I, I would guarantee that anyone in their right mind would pay $50 if there's a guarantee of a million dollars, not just a hope of a million, a guarantee. In fact, if you're like me, you'd probably say, well, if I give you 100, do I get 2 million? 400? Are we talking now? I can find some money for you. Yet the Bible says, here's a guarantee. If you seek me, you will find me. We are ever welcomed by God our Father. We're ever welcomed to, into his presence. He invites us to know him and to make our requests known unto him. Like the story of a little boy. He sat down next to his father, nestled up close to him. And the father said, well, what do you want? The son replied, just to be close to you, daddy. 
just to be close to you. Anytime we nestle up next to our Lord, he doesn't say, what do you want? He says, you'll find me if you seek me. See, there's a promise and a guarantee that we'll find God. And this morning, there's also a problem, though. The problem is this, that there will be no excuse if we don't. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, for the invisible things, the invisible things of him, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This morning, this is the point of where I'm going this morning. But if you don't know God, if you don't know him for salvation, never trusted him, if you don't know him after salvation as a Christian and, and you have just a small view, a, a cursory view, a jaded view of the knowledge of God, you are and I am without excuse. We won't be able to say, it's not my fault. Boy, people make excuses for everything. We like to tease children, but adults were no better at times. It was a lesson this past few weeks at our house, and having the kids recognize when they made a mistake to say, I'm sorry, it was my fault. Those are tough words. Are they not for all of us? I'm sorry, it was my fault. I blew it. I dropped the ball. I made a mistake. Our tendency, our natural, fleshy reaction, oh, no, no that's not my fault. I punched him because he punched me first. I thought he was going to punch me, so I punched him first. He called me something. I had no choice but to kick him in the teeth. But we will not be able to stand before Jesus Christ and say, well, I couldn't know you. I didn't have time to know you. I didn't know how to find out about you. I didn't know uh, about your word. No, we won't have any excuse. We cannot claim ignorance. We cannot claim inconvenience. There's a problem. We are without excuse. My friend, are you on a mission? Are you on a hunt to know God? You see, there are many things in this world that catch our eyes. The shiny lights, the bright lights, and the shiny trinkets. In 2021, I'm challenging us, challenging us only God. Are you on a mission to know God? David says it this way, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so my soul panteth after thee, O God. When you get up in the mornings, do you want to know God? When you lay down at night, do you want to know God? Or are you content just to check off a few boxes? Is seeking God the essence of why you're here on earth, or are you distracted? A few years back, there's a man, Forrest Fenn was his name, he buried a treasure. They looked for years to find it, and it was found in the last little bit, a year and a half ago or so, by a medical student from Michigan. It was buried somewhere in the U.S., and he found it buried in Wyoming. Up until this point, people had broken into the house, left threatening messages, lawsuits, all for the sake of a few measly dollars. We have the greatest treasure on earth. We can know who God is. And yet there are those who give more of their life for earthly trinkets. There's a missionary who'd been called home off the field. He's home on furlough, I'm sorry. He went to speak at a church. This church, one of his boyhood neighborhood friends came to the service. In the service, the missionary said this. He said, I've tried to live my life for Jesus Christ. His friend came up after the service and said, Robert, you have an experience which I do not you have a character that will stand in the way of anything that comes to you. Really, he said to the missionary, I'd give the world to have an experience in the character that you have. The missionary said, friend, that's just it. I have given the world, and I've given it up for Jesus Christ. My friend, if we can't give up that, we'll never seek him. And this is life eternal. 
that they might know thee, the only true God. At the end of the day, do you want to know God? Or are you content? Are you content with a small picture of God? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for revealing yourself to us. Lord, may we not be content with a small view of you. Lord, we are called to know you. Lord, we're promised to find you if we seek you. You're here this morning with the heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder who would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. I've been content with a small view of God. I don't have a mission to know Him. I don't have the vision to know Him. I've been satisfied to check off a few boxes and think I'm just okay. I'm distracted. I say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me this morning. Would you pray for me that I would begin like I'm called to, to seek to know God, who He is, and have a real relationship with Him. I'm not content just to have a jaded view or a small view. I want to know God. Who would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Then I praised hand. I'm asking that you'd pray for me this morning because God spoke to me. Who is that? Say, that's me, Pastor. Would you pray for me this morning? Amen. 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 Who else? That's me. Amen. I need to seek to know Him. I wonder if you're here this morning. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. One who would say, Pastor, as you spoke, something was going on inside my heart. I don't know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to know. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'd like to be sure, though. My friend, if you just slip your hand up, slip it back down, I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. But I'd love to pray for you this morning. But say that's me, Pastor. I'm not sure I'm saved. I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'd like to be. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. I'll slip it back down. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it, and I'll pray for you. Lord, as we come to this invitation, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be challenged by your word and your spirit. We would not be content, Lord, just to have a small view of you. But Lord, may our heart and our passion be to seek your face. Lord, you've seen these hands and Lord, you know what you're doing in the hearts. Lord, you do a work this morning. May we respond the way we ought to. In Jesus' name.